Hello, my name is Eric Stephen, and I am one of the pastors at the Village Church. The following podcast is a ministry of the Village Church. We hope that it inspires you, that it draws you closer to Jesus, and it opens your eyes to the possibilities of living in the kingdom. Enjoy, and God bless. Thanks, Michael. Let's pray. Father, thank you um, for tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to come and worship you. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to reflect on all that you have done in our life and all that you're inviting us to. And Jesus, as we uh, think about your birth, we thank you um, for becoming a man, fully God, fully man, living a life that we could not, dying on the cross for our sins, raising from the dead, and giving us hope um, that we too can follow you in the resurrection. Holy Spirit, as we wrestle with truth, as we wrestle with Scripture, as we wrestle with ourselves and one another, I ask tonight that you would give us the courage to believe what is true, the courage to do what is right, um, and the courage to be kind to ourselves and others. And I ask this in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. peace. Everybody wants it, nobody has it. We all, when I put peace up there, you all kind of know what it is. You have a sense of what peace is and what it is not. Um, A lot of times when we think about the word peace, we think about, oh, like, well, we'd like world peace. We'd like a lack of conflict. But honestly, most of the time when we think about peace, we're thinking about us and how we feel about life. So do we feel safe when we go out or do we feel understood or is it just do we have a lack of racing thoughts or do we have you know there's no anxiety an absence of anxiety would be peace right we all want peace we want to be calm we want our heart to stop beating at a high speed we don't want to have a watch that tells us every so often to relax and as we're, we're, you know, our heartbeat and our breath rate is too high and it tells you to relax, right? We all want peace, right? We want peace. And yet, for some reason, it's really, really hard to get it. It's hard to have peace. There are moments where we're like, oh, this feels so good, and then it goes away, right? There are moments, but we're, we're fighting for it. And now... 2,000 years ago or so, a baby was born, and there's a bunch of shepherds up on a hill, and they're just minding their own business, and this big old angel shows up and starts announcing the birth of this baby, and then as he's talking to the shepherds and telling them not to be afraid, then boom, out of nowhere, we find in Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 13, It says, suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those whom his favor rests. Jesus and his birth, God becoming human, fully God, fully human, becoming this tiny little baby, according to these angels, is bringing peace. Peace. Jesus brings peace. Christmas is about Jesus bringing peace. And yet, that isn't something that you and I kind of grab hold of, right? Christmas, in fact, seems to be more chaotic and financially stressful and it involves your family and all the things that you might have to do with family or the absence of your family. It involves a lot of lack of peace. And yet, it is all about peace. Jesus bringing peace. So what does that mean? Well, I'd like to start in the old hymn book of the Israelites, the Psalms. And there's a set of Psalms called the Psalms of Ascent, and they are 120 to 134, and they are my favorite psalms. In fact, other than Psalm 1, this, these psalms, are the, these 14 or 15 psalms, are the ones I read most, because I love them. Now, these psalms are about a story, or they are part of a story, and they're part of a journey for the Israelites three times a year 
They, all 12 tribes would get together and they would go on up the hill to Jerusalem to worship God. And they would sing and chant these psalms. And Psalm 120 is the first psalm. And at the end, the last five verses or so, or last three verses or so, it says this. Woe to me that I dwell in Meshech, that I live among the tents of Kedar. Too long I have lived among those who hate peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. So the beginning of this journey up the mountain to worship God is this acknowledgement that people don't have peace. In fact, they live among people who don't speak about peace. There's a longing for peace, but it seems like everybody else is for conflict. Have you, maybe some of you have felt that at Thanksgiving dinner. You were for peace, but everyone else at the table were upset because the sweet potatoes were not there, or whatever it is that was missing at your Thanksgiving dinner. Right? But we have that sense. But here we are. We're for peace, but everyone else is for war. So in this little poem, I want you to pay attention to two sets of words, Meshik and the tents of Kedar. Because this is a journey that they're going, and this is the beginning of the journey. And Meshik, for poetic sense here, is as far away as you can get from God's people and God himself. Okay? Meshik represents being far, far away. If you want to know about Meshik, you can go deep dive. It's very interesting. But it, in the poem, it just means as far away from God and God's people. And the tents of Kedar are a nomadic people. Kedar, they're, they're nomadic. Right? Both sets of people, the Meshik and Kedar, they're barbar- barbarians. Okay? But for us, in the poem, what we're being invited to, and this is what I want you to be invited into, is to think about your life and where you are at this moment. Where is your Meshik and where is your tent of Kedar? Where are the places in your life where you are far from God's people and far from God, where you are nomadic in your relationship with God and his people. Now, some of you might say, that's all of me, and that's good. That's a good acknowledgement. You know you're far from God's people, and you are far from God. Others of you might say, well, I'm, I'm pretty close to God and his people. Well, if you're honest with yourself, and that's what I'm asking you to do, be honest, there are parts of your life that are meshic. And there are parts of your life that are the tents of Kedar. There are parts of your life where you have said no to God's people and no to God. God has asked you for things, he's invited you into things, and you have said no. I'm not going there. Today I want you to take an honest look. This week I want you to take an honest look and say, okay, where in my life am I in Meshach, far from his people, far from God? Where am I nomadic in my relationship to God and his people. I want you to grab a hold of that because Advent starts today, basically, on Sunday. Really, it started on Friday, but it starts today on Sunday. And Advent, as we heard Michael say, means means arrival or coming, right? Advent is the four weeks or five weeks before Christmas where you celebrate, where you begin to focus on the arrival and coming of Jesus. Now, what's beautiful about this is that Advent is part of what we call the church calendar. And the church calendar is designed to disciple you. It is designed to reorient you. Okay? It's also designed to unify you with God's people, meaning that all over the world, God's people are celebrating Advent right now. And all different kinds of versions, but they're celebrating it. Now, Advent invites us into two things. Number one, it invites us into the reflection or a reflection on the birth of Christ. Most of you know the story, but I want to get you connected to it. So let me read the encounter with Mary and an angel where she announces, or he announces, the angel announces, that Jesus is going to be born to Mary starts in Luke chapter 1, verse 30. It says, But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son 
of the Most High, the Lord God, will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Advent is an invitation for you and I to begin a journey back towards the birth of Christ, to reorient us, to focus on what happened, that a baby was born to Mary who brought peace, and his kingdom never ends. Right? We're invited to celebrate that, focus on it, bring our whole life around it. And that's important. But Advent doesn't just actually mean arrival, but it means coming. And it's not just the first coming of Christ that we celebrate at Christmas. We lose that sometimes. We are celebrating and looking forward to the second coming of Jesus. And I want to read that, what that might look like to you. Because we're on a journey towards both of these, towards a celebration and a reflection on the birth and a journey towards an understanding and a grasping of what our hope is. To go back to what Michael said. Revelation 21, the first five verses says this. Then I saw a new heaven, and this is John speaking, and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautiful, dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. Advent is an invitation for you and I to reorient and begin a journey. We're invited to walk towards a feast. Because that is what Christmas is. Christmas is a big celebration of Jesus' birth and a celebration of our hope that Jesus is coming back to make all things new. And we're invited to reorient ourselves by understanding the parts that we are keeping away from Jesus and from his people. And so, the church, the larger church, invites us to fast. I, as your pastor, am inviting you to fast and take this journey with me. Now, Advent fasts are relatively simple. So as we begin to journey towards Christmas and to reflect on the birth and the coming of Christ, and that's our center, I'm going to ask you to fast on Friday. Every Friday until Christmas. Now, you can do any kind of fast. You could choose one meal and decide, okay, I'm not going to eat this meal. Or you could choose, like me, to remove all social media from your phone on Fridays. Okay? Others, just to turn off your ringers. Just giving you a hard... I'm just giving you our time. You can have your ringer. I don't have a problem with it. It was just a perfect timing. Whatever it is that you choose, I'm not saying choose something grand. I'm saying choose something very simple, but something that will actually disrupt you. Right? Taking social media off my phone will disrupt me, right? Maybe not, maybe not watching Netflix on Friday night. Because here's the purpose of fasting. The purpose of fasting is for you to be disrupted so you have to face some discomfort, some physical discomfort or some mental discomfort in order that it is a signal. So it's a signal to you to, okay, I'm going to step into some more intense relationship with Jesus in this moment. In this moment when I'm not eating, in this moment when I'm not flicking my phone, in this moment when I'm not sitting and watching Netflix, I'm actually going to take a moment to focus on Jesus. And what I'm inviting you to focus on is to ask the question, where is my meshik? Where am I far from God and his people? Where is my tents of Kandar? Where am I nomadic and inconsistent in my relationship with God? That fast, that little moment, let God speak to you in that, in your discomfort. Begin to reflect on where you are in that place. Okay? So I'm inviting you on that walk. I'm inviting you on that Advent journey with me. 
And to do that, you need to pack a backpack. So in your backpack, you're going to have to put some things. Now, I live with backpackers. I am not a backpacker. Um, I did a lot of backpacking in high school, and a few too many long hikes convinced me that that was not something I would enjoy. Oh, almost lost my water. But here are some things. Well, first off, this is kind of a picture I want to get you before get in your mind. Before you go backpacking, from my experience, is you must scatter all your supplies all over the house. <laughs> right? This is how you have to do it because you have to sort through the things you're going to put in your backpack and the things you're not going to take in your backpack. Right? And so I'm going to ask you in your metaphorical backpack, as you're journeying with me towards Advent, as we're reorienting ourselves, that you might put a couple things in. Number one, I'm going to ask you to put community in. Number two, I'm going to ask you to put your imagination. Number three, obedience. And number four, prayer. And we're going to kind of build this imaginary backpack out of Psalm 122, which, by the way, is in the Psalms of Ascent. And it is the first psalm that really kind of begins them on their journey. Okay? Psalm 122. Now, you can look it up on your phone. You can grab a black Bible. Psalms is about right in the middle of your Bible. I'm going to read through it and talk about just a little bit about how these things fit into your backpack and how they will help you reorient. Because David's psalm here is all about this traveling to worship and praise God, this or reorienting. And so the first thing he says in verse 1 is, I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Some translations say, I was glad. There's this sense of excitement, right? That he has that somebody asked him to go worship God. So the first thing I would say to you is glue yourself to the people who ask you to worship God. Glue yourself to the people who draw you to God and not to the people who don't draw you towards God right? So part of what you're putting in your backpack, the way you're going to reorient yourself is putting yourself strategically around people who draw you towards Jesus, who invite you into the worship of God, okay? David is like, I am so excited that people actually asked me to go worship God. Community, community of people who are saying, let's worship God together are important, they transform your thinking. They help you get over the bumps that are uncomfortable in your life, right? They move you along in the moments when you don't want to move. So I'm saying if you're, if you're out of community, if that's not a thing that you're... Glue yourself to people who point you towards Jesus so that you can become someone who points others to Jesus. It's very important. First thing that you're going to put in your backpack is community. Number two is imagination. In verse two and three, he says, our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built like a city that is closely compacted together. Now, David conquered Jerusalem. Jerusalem wasn't much of a city until David got it. And he built it out and he created it as a good space. Okay? And he's not there yet. He hasn't even really started his journey, but he's inviting everybody who's invited him to go worship. He's imagining what it might look like, right? Anytime that you wrestle with something that's hard for you, that seems to have control of you, the best way out of it is to imagine what life would be like if you didn't have that struggle, right? Your imagination is key to your spirituality, for here, David is imagining the end of the trip. I know a little bit about hiking, and I know the best way to get to the end is while you're hiking and your feet are killing you, imagining what the end is going to be like. The one problem, though, with hiking, just as a side note, when I talk to hikers, is it doesn't always seem like the destination is all that inspiring. And yet they still go. So, I, so <laughs> use your imagination to move. Now, what does that look like? as a follower of Jesus. What am I inviting you to put in your backpack? Well, number one, when it comes to Advent, 
I would invite you to use your imagination to think through the story of Jesus' birth. Stand next to Mary in your mind and tremble next to her as a big angel says, greetings, and she's like, whoa. And then a big angel says, by the way, you're going to have God as a baby, and God is going to come over you, and you're going to have a baby, and it's going to be God, and this is what you should name him. Imagine just what that might be like. Put yourself in that. Or walk alongside of Joseph and Mary as they frantically look for a place to stay because Mary's about to have a baby. Or imagine Mary laying Jesus in a kind of carved out stone with a bunch of animals around and a terrible smell and a bunch of people. Right? This is the beginnings of the king of the world, the person who brings peace. Part of us recentering ourselves is using our imagination to put ourselves in the story. Because when we put ourselves in the story of Scripture, we're changed, right? But number two, use your imagination to think about the future. Not the future of next year, the future that I read in Revelation. Where guess what? You aren't going to be on a cloud floating around. The kingdom of God is coming here. And guess what? You're going to have to listen to me teach still. Because you're not going to know everything, I guarantee you. You're going to see me in my fullness as a teacher. I will have no boring moments, and you will learn tons. And I will see you guys in your fullness. Right? Because when Jesus comes back and the kingdom comes to earth, you're still going to have work. But there aren't going to be any tears and there aren't going to be, isn't going to be any pain. And you're going to live in the fullness that God created you to be. And I am going to marvel at you and what Jesus has done. And I'm going to praise Jesus for the amazing creation. Right? And I am going to enjoy you and you're going to enjoy me. And we're going to do work together. But you have to imagine that because that's what's coming. But it's not here now. Right? It's not here now. We get little tastes of it. I get tastes of it as I interact with you, as I see truth and beauty push out of the darkness, as I see light scatter the darkness in our lives. We all get to taste it. We know it's true, but it's not finished. So you have to use your imagination on this trip towards the birth of Jesus to imagine what it will be like when he makes all things new. That is our hope to put your imagination in your backpack. Verse 4 and 5 says, That is where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to praise the name of the Lord according to the statutes given to Israel. There stands the thrones for judgment, the thrones for the house of David. There are two things I want you to think about. They both go under the heading of obedience. Advent invites us into an obedience or a submission, and the first one is a submission of unity. So the 12 tribes are doing their thing. They're hanging out. But three times a year they are told in Deuteronomy that they have to go up to Jerusalem to praise the Lord. And so they're called to all come together and to travel up to Jerusalem and to celebrate the different festivals And what David is saying is that there is a command to be unified. Yes, you are separate, you're out doing your thing, but now you have to come together and be unified. And a lot of times there's this accusation against Christians that we're not unified, that there is lots of denominations if you're a Protestant, and the Catholics and the Orthodox and Protestants, they don't like each other. That's not true. There are three categories. We are Protestant, we're Orthodox, and we are Catholic. And guess what? We are super unified. And we are called to submit to that. You know what? All of us believe that Jesus was God, fully God, fully man. All of us believe he died for our sins. All of us believe he rose from the dead. All of us believe that he ascended in heaven is going to return. All of us believe that the Holy Spirit has been sent to us. And all of us believe that scripture is inspired. And what David is encouraging the people of Israel and then also us is that Jesus' birth... And his kingship invites us into submission and obedience, and that means unity, not aggression, discord, argument. We are, Advent actually invites us to be 
unified under Jesus. So when I talk about obedience, there's a sub heading there, and that is that you are called to be unified, to strive for unity, right? for you and I to be unified. It's not just in our doctrines and theologies, it's in our friendships and in our relationships. We are called to be unified. Unity is transforming because it means I'm for you, not against you. You need to know that. Unity empowers us to be for one another, to think that way. Now, that's the first part of this. But the second part is David throws in this, well, this is where the thrones are, and this is where the throne of David is, right? And what David is saying is, there is a final authority, and it is in Jerusalem. For us, this psalm says to us, there is a final authority, and it is in Jesus. And so all things in our life have to come under that. That means if we go back to the beginning of what is your meshik and what is your tent of Kedar, the invitation of Advent is to bring those things with which you are saying no to God underneath him. Maybe it's habits, maybe it's a resistance to be kind, maybe it's a hundred different things. But whatever it is, what David is saying is when we come together to praise the Lord, all these things have to come under one authority, and that's Jesus. That that's, there's this rule that you and I are called to. Advent invites us to resubmit, in a sense, the places that aren't under submission. So in your backpack, community, imagination, obedience. Lastly, but most important, you and I are invited to pray. That this journey towards the birth of Jesus is a journey of prayer. And so David offers a prayer for Jerusalem. He says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my family and friends, I will say, peace be with you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. What is interesting here is that he does not say, strive for peace. He says, pray for peace. The way that you and I will be agents of peace is when we begin to pray for peace. But not just, dear God, will you give peace but actually specifically praying for peace in relationship. Because it's clear here that peace is communal. And so my invitation, and what I would like you to do over this Advent, is to to begin to pray this prayer of David for Jerusalem, but to pray it for your friends and for your city. That part of what you're going to put in your backpack as you journey towards the birth of Christ and the celebration of Christmas is this prayer for God's people, and for peace, and for your city. And so I would invite you to pray for the peace of the village and of Tucson and of your family. I would invite you to say, may those who love my church and my family and my city be secure. May there be peace within Tucson and within the village and within my home and security within your citadels, if any of you have citadels. I don't know about that. For the sake of my family and friends, I will say, peace be with you. For the sake of the house of the Lord, I will seek prosperity for my family, for my community, and for Tucson. My invitation is that as you go on this journey, part of the discipline that you practice is a discipline of prayer for peace. So, We're starting a journey. The calendar, the church calendar, the village, it's inviting you to reorient. It's inviting you to do some self-examination. Now, when I, uh, a long time ago, Keith, well, Keith always takes people backpacking, but a long time ago, there was a young man here in uh, the church who'd never been backpacking. And so he was going on this backpacking trip. And he thought he was going to do a lot of reading on this backpacking trip. So he back put his 
put a ton of books in his backpack. <laughs> Lots, not, not just a few books, but a lot of books and blankets. And then they went to Aravipa. Aravipa. And uh, guess who carried his backpack? Not him. <laughs> a lot of people on the backpacking trip carried his backpack. I say this because I think it's really important that as you journey towards the birth of Christ and as you try to reflect on the hope of his coming, that you do not fill your backpack with anything else besides community, imagination, obedience, and prayer. That is why you have to examine your life. That is why you have to think, what is my meshik? What is my tent of Kedar? Because they are very heavy in your backpack. And you're not going on this journey by yourself. You're going on this journey with all of us and with your family. And if you don't do that, they're going to have to carry your backpack. Or they're going to start throwing things out. And you don't want to be in the middle of the backpacking trip having to sort out things, right? So part of it is starting by having everything spread out and thinking this through. So that's my invitation to you. Some self-examination, some prayer. Connect yourself to community. Practice your imagination. And be obedient. That's the invitation. Now, as I've been talking, I've chose to make this short because I was hoping that as I talked, the Holy Spirit might have pricked some things in your heart or made you think about some stuff and that you'd like to offer or add a few things that I didn't add. So if you have anything you'd like to say, or the Spirit of God is telling you to say, I'm interested in hearing it. So. Uh, hang on, you need to say it in a mic. For those of us who don't have hearing. So I was just thinking about this earlier today, but it seems relevant about community. Um, I was just thinking about, well, okay, for those of you that don't know, my husband died 11 and a half-ish years ago, and I have four kids who were really young when he died. But all you guys taught me how to love because of the way faithfully over the years everyone kept showing up for me in lots of different ways and helping me with things that I could have done myself. Like, I didn't have to let my yard get out of control. I didn't have to let things happen. But nobody judged me. Everyone just came and helped me with the things I could have done myself, but they did it because they loved me. So thank you all for teaching me how to love. Thank you, Samantha. <laughs> Thanks, Samantha. Anyone else have some thoughts? Rose in the middle. I think um, <clears throat> I was just really struck by the um, the fact that God asks us to pray for peace, and He asks us to pray for things over and over throughout His Word. Um, and I just think, in contrast, how you know other other belief systems do strive towards peace um and like that's like some sort of like holy grail you know what i mean is having this inner peace and um and i just he's so good that he just wants to freely give it to us and um i don't know i was just really struck by that and the fact that he wants us to always be in communion with him and I don't know, he really is such a good God, and I don't know, that just hit me. Thanks, Rose. Thank you very much. Yep. Vivi in the corner over there. Uh, this mic is really intimidating, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just thinking of the, the book idea, um, having a bunch of books in your backpack, and I feel like... <laughs> In the beginning of the backpacking trip, if you have a bunch of books in your backpack, that throwing them out as you go is like throwing out the baggage that you have and and like taking on everyone on the backpacking trip, like 
everything that they tell you, everything that they're saying to you, that's what you put in your backpack. So you take out all the garbage that you have in your backpack and leave. Your backpack is lighter when you leave, but it's lighter with more wisdom. And yeah, so I just thought that was a beautiful image. Cool. Thanks for that. I, uh, Go for it, Julie. Um, I also think sometimes we need other people on our backpacking trip to <laughs> let us know what that maybe this thing that you're holding on to is a heavy book that you don't really need right at this moment. You may read it at home sometime, but that <laughs> you don't necessarily need it in this moment and sure. that it might be disrupting your self-reflection and offering of yourself to God because you're focused on something that's good, but but isn't for now. Yeah. I like that. Karen also, and then Emily. I was, yeah, like, <coughs> Julie's extending the metaphor, and I, I feel like it's really important that we be gentle with people when we either tell them that, <laughs> or sometimes it's just better to carry it. Mm. Sometimes it's not the right time to ask them to get rid of that book or put it down. Um, and that can be hard. So I think prayer is actually part of what helps me with that process. Um, prayer also helps me to see um, the process that's going on. It gives me the eyes to see. Because peace is something that takes, like peace in relationships, when things have been really broken in families or broken in us because of suffering that we've endured. I mean, it can take years or decades or even generations. So um, for me, prayer is something that helps. Like last Sunday when Rod was talking about God doesn't need you to fix people. And I was... I was wrestling with that. I know that what he said is true, but I still wrestle with feeling a burden of maybe I need to do more. Mm -hmm. And there was a young person in my extended family had a conversation with him Friday night. After not seeing him in years, he'd been estranged from us because of choices and brokenness in his life. And I was like, a story he told about his dog caring about his dog like God talked to him through his dog <laughs> mm -hmm. that was Jeremy and my takeaway mm -hmm. and it's like wow so but being able to see that yeah. having the eyes to see that is part of the peace process I think sure yeah I just wanted to Keep talking about the book. Oh my goodness! <laughs> Analogy, um, and just bring out that, like, you know, from what Julie was saying, that those, you know, books aren't necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they can represent something like that, but they're not necessarily a bad thing. And what I like about the story was that I'm pretty sure, from knowing how backpackers are, that um, something was mentioned before the trip, mm -hmm. and um, and yet. Those same people who said, yeah, you probably shouldn't take all that, still carried the backpack. Yeah. And so <laughs> just wanted to say, like, I think that's part of our community is people do that for us. Like, yeah. maybe they told us we, hey, maybe not. And then still later they help us when we were like, no, yeah. I'm doing it. And then, ugh, like, okay, they're helping us. They're not just like, told ya. Right. Right. So. That's true. Uh, yeah. I, I think this is just a beautiful picture. You're right. Community doesn't say, you know, let, let's not do that. Let's not carry all those things. And, oh, I don't want to go with you. They're just like, let's go praise the Lord together. We're, we're still doing the same thing, no matter what your backpack looks like. I will say that the community did help this novice. <laughs> <laughs> and we, uh, we made a pile halfway way on the way to the trip and say, We'll pick it up on the way back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. Yeah, that's beautiful. I found that 
bringing too much stuff on a backpacking trip is kind of like a rite of passage. Um, where you look back and you realize that you still got to your destination despite overpacking. And I consider backpacking a spiritual discipline. And I've always been met by God, hmm. regardless of how much I have overpacked or if I, I've foolishly taken something. And now I have it down to a science hmm. where it's like four things. And I don't need anything else. And God meets me anyway. That's awesome. I think um, the beauty of Advent is that it is a continual backpacking trip. Next year we will go on Advent, and next year we will go on Advent, and we will be reoriented, and eventually we will get down to the four things <laughs> that we're supposed to have in our... Right, yeah, that's, that's really cool. You guys, I, I, did, I didn't realize, like, you guys are the backpackers. The morning people had all different analogies to go with, so this is awesome. Julie in the back... I think it's cool that Advent is at the very beginning of the church calendar and that it's, it is a reorientation and then we move through the different stages of Jesus' life and death and, mm -hmm. and then into ordinary time, which is just this long period of time where there's nothing really special. It's just regular living it out, you know? Mm -hmm. So I I enjoy that aspect of the church calendar. It's cool. All right, I have a few more minutes if anybody wants to say anything. Otherwise, I can close and pray. Anybody got any last thoughts on backpacking or books or um, uh, Kindle? Yes, bring a Kindle. There you go. Bring a Kindle <laughs> on your backpacking trip. All right, let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you so much for backpackers and the way they bless us. And thank you for this community and the way that your wisdom is just expressed through them. And I always enjoy hearing what you're saying while I speak. Um, and so thank you for that. Thank you for them. I just pray that as we eat together, that you would bless our conversation. As we sing together, that you would take our words as praise. Um, and as we participate in worship as a whole, uh, know that we love you. And I ask this in your holy name, Jesus. Amen.